Welcome, Soundies, to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 28th of March, 2021. I only say that you guys already know that, but for people that are watching it later, uh, today is our first live stream with the new ATEM Mini Extreme ISO Mark II Gen Next. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not making fun of Blackmagic for their crazy naming screen. It's hard to name products. It's uh, It's a difficult job to do, but... They will get it worked out, I'm sure. So we're going to go ahead and let them work on that. All right, let's jump over to our agenda. We have a lot of things to cover for today. First up, for those that um, care, <laughs> some of you do and some of you probably don't, but Pro Tools has now been certified to run on Mac OS Big Sur, so the latest operating system. However, there is a caveat there. It will only work on Intel-based hardware. It does not yet work with Apple Silicon, the M1 chips. So just keep that in mind if you are a Pro Tools user. Uh, we will go in next up after the uh, next, we're going to jump into some pre-submitted questions. Then we'll go to the chat for a little bit. And then after that, we do have some gear that we have one thing for sale and three things to give away. So let me just, um, we'll come to that later. We'll, we'll cover the questions first, and then we will come to that later. So let's jump into our questions and see where we start here. Um, first up, this is from Rob. I was editing my most recent 48-second long opus for TikTok and YouTube shorts. <laughs> uh, don't forget to like and follow. And I found this weird buzz when I said three on one of the takes. I was able to find a better take, but I am still curious as to the cause. Me or some weird recording artifact or ghosts? I've attached the offending clip, mind taking a look with your soundy crew. So let me just pull something up here. All right, we're gonna switch over to our Mac here. And um, this is the waveform. And let me just kind of play through it a couple times here. It'll, it'll actually repeat, so be ready for that. Three, 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 three. Rob's probably cringe, cringing right now. But you can hear that kind of odd thing at the start when he's saying th the, the TH part of the three. Um, and you can see this is what it looks like in the waveform right here. And then if we come over to the spectrogram view, notice what's what's happening here. We have this kind of weird, we have a couple things. We have this sort of ramp and we have these kind of repeating, oh, five to seven kilohertz or uh, four to six kilohertz, uh, little kind of blobs of energy. So that's interesting. Um, and I have to confess, Rob, I don't really know the answer to why that happened exactly. Um, however, I have, I can, I'm happy to guess, <laughs> um, as long as everyone is willing to accept that this is purely guessing, I don't, I don't technically know. I think you were using a dynamic microphone. So a Rode, uh, what's it called? Rode pod something, pod mic, I think. So... That's a dynamic microphone. I think there are times when dynamic microphones, especially when you get into the higher frequencies, can do some kind of funny things. They don't, their diaphragms don't move as quickly, generally. Um, I, but I don't know, maybe it's a larger, I don't know. I really don't know, I'm just totally guessing. However, I can say that this is, you could definitely do some things to fix this if you had to. Um, you had other takes, so it wouldn't be anything you'd need to worry about. You could just go to a different take. But here's what I would do, for example. Here we're in Isotope, and we could do some spectral work on it. So I'm going to turn on the instant process and set it to replace. Come to the brush. First, take care of this ramp. Okay, that took care of that. Let's play it back now. Three, three, three. Okay, so that kind of weird almost hyper quick crickety sound <laughs> is still there. However, let me undo and play this again. You hear that little ramping thing? Three, three, three. I think that's actually mouth noise. I think that's actually something that was probably really there. Just kind of something funny happened in terms of where your tongue was relative to your teeth when you said that one. But that's one way I would get rid of that. And then in terms of this, we could the, um, the kind of clicking sound, we could take care of that as well. This is what I would do. Let's play. 
through it. Three, 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 three. There, my friends, is the magic of RX. <laughs> so it, totally usable. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really know what caused it in the first place. It's, I have to guess, it was probably a combination of a mouth noise that just happened, and the way your microphone responded to it. So that's my best guess on that, Rob. Hope that was helpful. And um, there's a little demo of RX in the process. All right, thanks, Rob. Next up from Andrew, I've had a question on my mind since I heard you mention that you normalized audio to minus 14 LUFS a few weeks ago. I think you were referring to YouTube videos at the time. During your audition course, you spoke about normalizing to minus 16 LUFS for preserving dynamic range and using minus 19 LUFS for mono dialogue tracks. Can you please clarify what uh, levels you recommend for corporate, online, YouTube, Vimeo platforms, and perhaps when you might recommend different normalization levels? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, Andrew, thank you for the question. So minus 14 LUFS is, is not typically what I aim for when I'm working on a dialogue-driven piece, a piece that is primarily spoken word content. When we're in those situations, I almost always target minus 16 LUFS for stereo or minus 19 LUFS, which is perceptually the equivalent for mono. Um, so um, the, the reason that YouTube, I believe, if I had to guess, targets minus 14 LUFS for, that's their, that's their loudness ideal, I guess. That's the target that they have set. And the way that they handle it is that if content comes in and it's louder than minus 14 LUFS, they'll actually pull it down. If it's quieter than minus 14 LUFS, they'll just leave it alone, let it be. Um, on Spotify, I think it works a little differently. I think on Spotify... If I'm not mistaken, it normalizes everything to minus 14 LUFS. So for music, especially popular music, that seems to make sense to me because most popular music is already pretty well really compressed. <laughs> and so what you'll find is actually if you watch a meter, like a proper audio meter, peak meter, when you're listening back to Spotify, you'll notice that some of the songs, the peaks will come all the way, you know, almost up to minus zero or to zero dB. And on others... It will sound just as loud, however, the meters won't come up as high. And I think that's usually music that has been compressed harder, and it was louder than minus 14, so they had to pull it down to play it back on Spotify. So that's an example. Now, for me, for spoken word content, it is a personal choice. I, there have been other podcast um, engineers and other people who have recommended this as well, but for online content, I generally recommend minus 16 or minus 17 LUFS when it's primarily spoken word. And the reason for that is that you can compress and, and, and loudness normalize to minus 14 for spoken word as well and generally make it sound okay, but a lot of times it just ends up sounding kind of crunchy. So that's why I prefer minus 16 or minus 17 stereo for spoken word content. Um, for TV in the European Union, our European Broadcast Union's spec is minus 23 LUFS stereo. And in those cases, you generally don't even have to um, compress at all for dialogue. Almost always you can, you can push the loudness up to that level and you won't have to do any compression to manage any sort of transients or peaks that would otherwise get clipped. So that's really nice. In the United States, that same thing for television, this is again for television broadcast, is minus 24 LUFS. So I would say mainly for, if you're, if you're going to produce a video that's going to be in, uh, played in a theater, then I would probably target minus 23 LUFS. If you're producing anything that is mainly for consumption online on the web, whether that's a podcast, a spoken word video, whatever, I would generally target minus 16 LUFS. That's my personal preference. Hopefully that makes sense. Thanks, Andrew, for the question. All right. Next up from Kevin, the basic filmmaker. I don't know that he was able to attend today because, oh, he is here? He's here? Kevin is here. Kevin is here. Kevin's in the house, and Joe Mustang said he'd stay even if Kevin was here, so that's great. <laughs> um, Kevin sent in a question. Since I don't own professional... This is actually a question that was asked of him, and he wasn't sure how to answer it, so he decided to hand it over to me. Um, since I don't own professional sound blankets and was asked this question, I thought I would throw it at Mr. Audio Guy, you. The question was, quote, I see $40 or much more for one sound blanket, and for about half that, I can get, like, six thick moving blankets from Amazon. I can assume the pro blankets are all the better, but are they really that much better for the room where I make videos? Is it really worth the extra money? 
Um, so this there's a spectrum here, and people will have different opinions along the entire spectrum. And it may be that the you know forty dollar forty dollars for six moving blankets is going to work just great for you, and that's fine. I'm not here to force you to spend more money or <laughs> encourage anyone to spend more than they should. Um, what I can say is this: a couple of things about moving blankets that I would be careful of. Number one, a they're generally modern moving blankets that I've seen, and that is moving blankets made in 2021. Generally, what they do is they use synthetic materials and they try to keep them as light as possible while still providing padding for the furniture that they're generally made for. So you, the idea is you put them around furniture so you can stick them on a moving truck and not scratch up the furniture. And so it doesn't need to be super heavy to do that, but they just need some padding and that's what they aim for. What that means in practical terms is it won't generally um, absorb as much sound because they're lighter. Uh, another thing that I would be can, careful about with moving blankets is that oftentimes they come in colors like blue. Um, and the problem with a blue blanket on a film set is that it will reflect light and it will cast blue. So if you don't want to affect your light, that's the nice thing about the producer's choice blankets, for example, which are the ones I use from vocalboothtogo.com. And I don't have any sort of affiliate relationship with them, so they um, I just bought my blankets there. Um, they're black on one side, white on the other side. So they're neutral in terms of color, and you can use them to reflect more light back if you want to with the white side, or if you don't want them to reflect light, you turn it over to the black side. So um, those are some things to consider. So I'm not saying don't buy moving blankets and don't use them. They're horrible and they don't do the job. They actually probably do help some. Um, they don't help as much as the moving, the moving, or sorry, the sound blankets are much heavier. They're usually filled with cotton or other natural fibers. Um, so they're kind of a pain to work with, frankly. They are heavy. They are very heavy. And that's how they are effective. So it's just up to you. Um, anything that's soft and will absorb sound will help. Um, but if you really, you know, it depends on your room too. How much reverberation do you have in your room? Um, that's another question. So I would say if you'd like to save money, go ahead and buy the moving blankets and see how they work for you. I'd just be careful about the colors. Just try not to get anything that's going to mess up the color of your light. So... Thanks for sending that in, Kevin. Um, I think Andrew from Deity, uh, Andrew Jones, actually, I think I saw him on one of his videos talk about, yeah, moving blankets are good enough. And so oftentimes that's the thing too. Good enough is good enough. So for some people, um, it's worth the extra money to spend, you know, $1,000 on an MKH-416 shotgun microphone versus a Rode NTG-2, I guess. <laughs> um, for other people... The NTG2 is just good enough, and they're perfectly happy with, with the results, and they're listening on earbuds, and most of their audience is listening on earbuds. You know, it just really depends. You, you get to choose what your standards are. I am not here to say you have to go for the most expensive, very best. All right, next up from Zach. I'd be interested to hear your experience with the um, Sheps CMC641, uh, the CMIT 5U, or other DC-biased microphones. Specifically, have you run into issues with humidity? And let me just pause there. I'll go ahead and read the rest of it, too. Um, I live in Utah in the United States. This is a desert. It is the second most arid state in the United States. So, no. <clears throat> I've not run into issues with humidity here. Um, however, that doesn't mean that no one will ever run into issues with humidity. Here's the problem with the DC bias microphones, and it's usually only a problem when you get into really humid places. So let me come back to that here. Let me just read the rest of the question. I keep hearing about it as a concern, but no one seems to provide any real limitations as far as how humid it is too humid. Personally, I think the whole thing may be just a little overblown and repeated on the forums by people who don't have any real experience. Nevertheless, <clears throat> excuse me, I ask because I'm looking at a CMIT 5U and I'm wondering if I should also get a 416 for when I shoot in humid or rainy environments. Additionally, I have a CMC641 already, and I'm wondering if I should pick up an MKH50 or 8050. I'm not wanting to spend all my money on mics. I just want to know what is practical to consider. Let me, um, it's a good question. Let me grab something here. Please drink water also. And, and I'm also told that I need to drink water, which I will do. Okay, so let's go to the main cam here, Emma. Here is the Sheps CMIT 
um, or sorry, not the CMIT, the M, the CMC six forty one, the M, it's the, the hyper or sorry, the super cardioid capsule with the Colette six series preamplifier. You'll notice up here, it comes with this little kit. Um, let me just pull this out before I dump everything everywhere. And that to Emma. Okay, so there's this little thing. This is to hold the capsule. And then there's a little cap here with a sponge to hold it in place to keep it from knocking around. If you're going to be somewhere really humid, rain, think rainforest, or it's been raining for days, or you're at the beach um, and you've been in an air-conditioned hotel and you're going to walk outside to where it's far more humid, what I would recommend is put the capsule in this. If you, I don't know if yours came with this. Mine came with this. And then let the microphone get up to the you know back to the temperature of the new place where you're going to be shooting a bunch of humidity will probably condense on the outside of this and once that's done and once it's back you know up to the temperature of the place the ambient temperature of where you're shooting you can take it out and put it back on the microphone and generally you will not run into a problem so um is it overblown yeah it doesn't happen all the time but it, it definitely can happen and there will be people that live in much more humid environments than me that will say yeah it's been a problem and i've run into it before so it's not it's not a it's not an internet myth i will say that but it is something that's surmountable and you can you can deal with it it's not it's not insurmountable but that's how i would approach it if you don't have um one of those little things just put your whole put the whole mic in a ziploc bag and then when you take it outside, let it, you know, acclimate to the ambient temperature outside and then take it out once it's gotten to that temperature and you're less likely to run into that. Of course, you have to keep all water off of the capsule. That's what creates the problems on DC bias microphones. So um, that's mainly what I can say about that. So, yeah, I wouldn't buy anything just yet. I would work with them first and see if you run into that problem. You may not. So there's some thoughts on that. So thanks for the question, Zach. It is a very good one. All right, next up for Frank. I am a solo shooter and do my own sound. I have a Mix Pre 6 first gen, and I'm struggling with the right settings and need your help. I have three wireless Sennheiser G3s that are assigned the channels one through three. I have a Sennheiser ME66 K6 assigned to channel four. When in editing, the way my current setup is, the channels are not isolated. All the microphones are mixed together in a left-right mix. My Mix Pre 6 is already in advanced mode, but I don't know what else I need to do to make sure that each channel is isolated isolated for editing in Final Cut or Adobe Audition. Please help. Okay, let's come over to our Mix Pre over here. Um, okay, so on the Mix Pre, um, let's just make sure that we're in advanced mode here. So I'm coming over to the system menu. I'm going, yes, I'm in advanced mode. So that's the first thing. So you already have that, so that's good. The next thing you need to do is you come into each of your channels. Now you have this arm feature right here. If you do not arm a channel, it will be sent to the mix based on where you set the fader. However, it will not be recorded as an isolated channel. You have to actually arm it to make sure that it gets recorded to its own isolated channel. And the way this will look in your WAV file is the left and right channels will be the first two that come into the WAV file, and then it'll be input one, input two, input three after that, or four, or, you know, however many you have on your mix pre. So you just want to come into each of the channels and make sure that they are armed. So this one, for example, is disabled. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this back on to mic level. And then I'm going to arm it. So that's armed. Um, we're going to come over into input three. It's also off. I'll go ahead and turn it on. And we'll also arm that. Now I would get all three of these recorded to isolated channels within that PolyWave file. So again, you'll have left mix, right mix, channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four. So you'll have six channels show up in that WAV file. And that's how you get those isolated channels to record. So hopefully that helps. Frank, thanks for the question. And it's a good one. It's a tricky one. That's the thing with the Mix Pre and a lot of the other, the Zoom F series, is they work more like professional mixers. That is to say, they give you a lot of flexibility, but you, you have more settings you have to manage too. <laughs> So in that case, the, the nice thing about the arm disarm thing is you don't have to record an isolated channel if you don't want to. There are some cases where you just want to mix. And so that can be a case where you might do something like that. All right. Um, Lee asks, I want to ask if a ferrite filter ring is effective and a necessity 
putting on my XLR cables? Does it really work or it doesn't have any effect at all? And do, and I do have a SanDisk, um, wait, that seems like a separate question. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> Let me just show you what a ferrite core is. Again, back to the overhead camera here. Um, so here's a camera here, or a ca sorry, a cable that was made by my friend Alan over at SoundSpeeds. It does have a ferrite core right here on the cable on the output end. And um, the idea here is, he, I, I talked to him about this actually, because most of my cables don't have ferrite cores. And he says, well, I just put it there as a, an extra precaution. It's just one more level of protection against interference. And that's all he does. He puts it on there for that. Um, so I will, I will talk about these in general. Um, the ferrite cores do work. In fact, at my SQ5 mixer, when I connect that to my computer via USB, I get a horrible buzzing sound. And so what I did is I went out and bought a, actually a USB cable with ferrite cores on it, one on each end actually, and the buzz disappeared, went away. So the question is, I mean, if the question is, do they work? The answer is in circumstances where you're picking up interference, they can help, yes. Um, do you need them? Not necessarily, most of the time I don't pick up that kind of interference and so it's not critical to have them. But the reason Alan again puts them on there is that when he's working on set, um, you know, he, as a professional, that's his that's his job, and his job is to deliver to deliver clean sound, and so he's going to take all the precautions he can to make sure he does that, and not have to troubleshoot while everyone else in the crew is and and the cast is sitting around waiting for him to fix fix his problem. So, um, you don't have to, but if you can, I think it's another level level of protection that's worthwhile. Next question here, and I do have a SanDisk Extreme sixty four gigabyte card. But I decided to upgrade to a SanDisk Extreme Pro 128 gigabyte. Do you think it's an overkill in terms of speed, or is it just a luxury to have? I'll be waiting for the response later. I hope my question gets read. Thank you very much. Good news, your question got read. Thank you for sending it in. Um, if it's, if you're talking about cards for audio recorders, they generally you don't generally need really fast cards. Has been my experience, and in fact, what I find is that sometimes the fastest, the newest, fastest cards actually cause problems. So. What I would recommend instead is taking a look at the manufacturer's recommended media list. Um, Sound Devices has them. I think Zoom has them. Zoom recorders, the F recorders, have a little feature built in where you can actually test the card before you go to a recording. And they have a quick test and a more extensive test. So I would definitely run your cards through that test if you're using a Zoom F series. Um, and then if you're using a Sound Devices, um, I would stick with the cards that are on the recommended list as well. So you don't generally need like v60 or v90 cards you just don't um i mean if you go to higher track counts you're going to need something that's fast enough but if you stick with the list of recommended cards you're usually going to be in good shape so all right leo asks i came off a week's shoot at a theater performing shakespeare it was a bear <laughs> well leo i'm glad to hear that because that is how you become a better mixer is by doing really hard jobs First, they wanted seven wireless lobs for the actors, struggling to prevent rustling noises or RF issues. Only three of the seven wireless were mates. The others, all different types. Crossover and swirl noise were real a real issue. I convinced the director to go with booms the rest of the shoot. I have a Seamit 5U, Sennheiser MKH8060, and two 641s. One boom was locked down, and the other was on a uh, with a boom op. I put the 641 on a sandbag on a chair out of the frame line. I have great coverage until the cast screams and shouts Shakespeare lines, which happens often. <laughs> I was recording and mixing with a Zoom L12, which does not have a limiter, so screams were always clipping. There was no time to kill the fader between lines. Do you have a recommendation on how to control very loud noises when a limiter is not available? Um, I do have some thoughts there. So, first of all, the L12, if I'm not mistaken, has a one-knob compressor. Compressors and limiters are related. They're very similar, except the compressors are not as... They generally don't attack quite as quickly, so some things will still get through if you have a scream. Um, sometimes that'll still get a little bit through, but it will help a little bit. It'll help pull the levels down just a little bit. So I wouldn't be afraid to use that, first of all. Um, obviously, there's a whole thing of optimizing your gain. Now, if you drop the gain enough to leave enough headroom, you could end up, you know, with a with more of a noise floor. So you have to be careful on that. And I, I don't have a sense for how clipped the clip parts were. If you're just talking about a transient clipping, 
usually you can actually do a fair bit of work on that in post. It'll actually sound pretty decent. Um, Isotope RX, for example, has a declipper. Uh, Adobe Audition has one. There are lots of others as well, but they essentially reconstruct those transients or the peaks. Now, if you're if they're pushing hard up against it and it's really, really badly clipped, then yeah, you need to pull your gain down is basically the only choice you have there. Um, but I, I am not usually too afraid. If there's just a little bit of it, that's not too much of a problem. So um, if you have square top waveforms, that's a problem. If you have periodic transients that are chopped off, not as much of a problem. That's generally how I would look at it. Um, and if you can't, you know, what's interesting is clipping, you can't always hear it unless you have the sharpest of ears. You can't always hear it if it's just a transient that gets clipped. It's when you have a more substantial duration of a waveform that gets clipped that you that almost everyone can hear it. So that's another thing that you can use as kind of a gauge for how, you know, where you need to set your gain to kind of optimize for those particular situations. So hopefully that helps. Um, that's a tricky situation. I wish those uh, G3s would have, or, you know, had limiters in them, but they don't. Um, that's where some of the higher end wireless systems come into play too, like the Electros and the Audio Limiteds and the Wizzies. They've all got um, limiters in the transmitters, so that helps there too. So, all right, Leo, thanks for that. Hope that helps a little bit. Uh, next up is from Ding. My name is Ding from Sound Team Laos. Do you have any basic information about sound mix, auto mix, and using faders for dialogues? I'm using a Sound Devices 633 and a Zoom F8N. Why and how to use it? I never used it before, but saw many sound man talk about on YouTube. Yes, so I do have, uh, if you go to YouTube, do a search for Curtis Judd Mix Assist, you will see a demonstration video where we actually use an auto mix on the Sound Devices Mix Pre. And... Um, that will give you a sense. We give a we give a sample with the auto mix and without the auto mix. You can hear the difference between them. And it, especially, I will say this: it makes more sense when you have. Um, it doesn't. It, it helps when you have two people, two different mics. Um, it helps even more when you have more than two people. So it makes a big difference. All it's doing, really, ding, is it's taking the fader for each person. So the amount of audio that's being sent. To the mix from that person so when person a is talking it'll take person b's level their fader and pull it back a little bit and the reason that helps is that when this person's talking the sound in the room will also get into the, the other person's microphone at a delay you know it takes longer to get to the other person's microphone so that will create phase interactions and also um, anytime this person talks and their sound bounces off the wall and comes into this other mic that creates even more of that problem. So pulling the fader down on that person who's not talking makes this person sound cleaner because you're not also getting their reflected sound in this channel. If that makes sense. And then when person B starts talking, you just do the inverse. You pull down person A's fader and person B, you know, their microphone stays active and all of the audio that they're talking, saying, and all the things they're saying get, you know, captured by that microphone and not by person A's. So it's just a way to make a cleaner sounding mix. That's all it does. You still get your isolated channels recorded without any sort of effect to them. So they will still pick up all of the reflected sound and you then it, you know, presumably will then clean that up in post. Um, but if you can make an auto mix work, it can save you a lot of that work in post production. So that's the main idea with that. All right, that's everything we had on pre-submitted questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at the chat. How are we doing on time? We've got, let's do maybe 10 minutes in the chat and then we'll get over to our uh, to the gear. So Emma's combing through the chat right now for us, looking for exciting questions to bring up. <laughs> Emma loves doing live streams. Hope everyone's having a good, uh, good week and that you, and that you did get out and make some good sound and that you get out and make some more good sound this week. I'm, I have some exciting projects coming up that I'm excited to look at. Oh, here we have a question from Chris. We'll come back to my projects in a little bit. Do you have any suggestions for audio into the 3.5 millimeter input of the ATEM Mini Extreme? Probably plan on using line level because you mentioned the preamps might not be so good. Thanks. Um, the music, the intro music that we played at the start of the stream here was into the input input number one on the ATEM Mini Extreme. So um, yeah, I would, I would avoid the preamp if you can, if you've got something better. But if you, I mean, if you have a good microphone, the preamps are okay. They're, they're not, you know, good enough for live, I'd say. 
So that's my perspective on it. Um, but if you've got uh, if you've got a mixer you can use instead, and it's not a, I would use the mixer instead. <laughs> um, I would. I think that the the trick with the three point five millimeter input is it well, you know it. I think actually can it can provide plug in power. There's actually a new setting in the software control, and actually Emma, if you would mind switching over to the computer here. Um, if we pop up into the audio settings here on the general tab, you can see there's actually uh, some new, new settings. It used to be just microphone or line, but now you have microphone plus plug-in power or just microphone or line. And you might use these at different times. So if you're plugging a microphone in directly to the input, then you would probably use microphone plus plug-in power. That's going to be a most lavalier microphones or any other kind of microphone that needs 3 to 5 volts plug-in power. Now, if you're plugging in a battery-powered shotgun microphone, for example, a lot of times you could just switch to this microphone because the microphone's already providing its own power, but it is delivering a microphone-level signal. So that's what the second one is. And then the third one, of course, is line level. And so that's what we used for the iPhone. They changed the line level, which is interesting. Um, they actually dropped, they dropped its sensitivity even more. It looks like it, in the previous generation, it was actually delivering a little bit of amplification. Um, but now when I plug in my phone, I basically have to watch this. So here's the channel that the phone was on, mic one. We had to bump the gain up. Uh, the phone output is at 100%, and the mic input is set to plus six, and the fader's at its max, plus 10. So it's almost like they dropped the line level. that They were previously applying like 60 d 16 dB of gain, it feels like, somewhere around there. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So those are my thoughts and experience with uh, the mic inputs. I think they're okay. Um, they're not going to win any awards, but they're they're probably good enough for most live streams, I would say. All right, thanks for that, Chris. From Ken, have you ever felt the need to purchase a Cut 1, Cut 2, or Cut 60 for your CMC6 MK41? Not for mine. So th for those, I assume what you mean, um, I, I don't, I assume those are um, pads. So they're reducing the input level. Ken, if you could clarify, I think that's what they are. I don't even know for sure. But I've never, I, I don't usually need pads. I'm not usually recording guitar amplifiers or anything like that. So for me, it's 99%. It's dialogue. And so I haven't ever needed anything like that. But if you are going to record loud sound sources, um, that could definitely make sense. Okay. Next up. Um... And I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. So, Honte? I um, apologize if I got that wrong. What's your vote on Sennheiser MKH 50 versus Sheps 41? I read about both and used both, but I can't decide with one. Um, <laughs> um, I can't either. Um, I would say, to me, the MKH 50 sounds a little more aggressive. It sounds like you're a little bit more, I don't know, it sounds more like an action movie to me. The Sheps sounds brutally honest, I would say, <laughs> um, which means I would say this, if you're going to, if you're not going to have a lot of time to do post, I would probably go with the MKH-50. The 41 on a lot of voices, in my experience, needs a bit more EQ to kind of optimize the sound. That's been my experience, but they're both great microphones. You can't go wrong. The, I guess the advantage in, in the context of the question we read earlier, if you're going to be working in super humid environments, that MKH-50 MKH will probably... Um, it will, it'll be a little bit more humidity immune. Um, so that's one thing to consider, I guess, but Sheps are great microphones. Sennheisers are great microphones. You probably can't go wrong. We, either way you go. All right. Kevin, that mix pre three stand from sound devices. How can I get one of those want? Um, it's actually, yes, it is by sound devices. It is a, um, it's what they use at their trade shows. And I would tell you where you could get one, but then I'd have to shoot you. So we can't do that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. That's called the Pix E stand. Um, I haven't seen them for sale recently, but the way I got mine at Gotham Sound, um, they've sold them. They might have them at B and H. Um, it's called the Pix P I X dash E stand from Sound Devices. So I'm just joking about the shooting part, of course. All right. Do you think there will be a tentacle tracky or Zoom F2 or similar cheaper device with wireless transmitter, or is Zaxcom blocking that? Uh, well, 
I, I don't know all the ins and outs of the patents. There's, there's a lot of nuances with the patents, and I haven't read them. So I don't know the details. Um, I imagine that somebody's going to build something like that at some point. I think if I read correctly, somebody was kind of going back and forth in the comments on one of my videos recently. They did go read the patents. Evidently, those patents from Zaxcom run out here in the next three years or so. At which point it'll be kind of an open market and we'll probably see some of that. So it'll probably be a few years, but yes, I think we'll probably see some of that. It'll be interesting too, um, whether or not Zaxcom sues Rode for their recent wireless go to and its ability to record at the transmitter. I don't know if they have a case for that, but they've been very particular about that in the past. So, all right, Tic Tac 2930. Regarding RPAN streaming, Rode NT USB Mini or MXL 990 with Mix Pre 3, which setup would you choose? Uh, well, the NT USB Mini is a USB only mic. The MXL 990, I'm not familiar with. Let me take a look and see what I can find here. MXL 990. Is it also a USB microphone? Or is it a. Does it have an XLR output? If it's got an XLR output, that makes more sense with the Mix Pre 3. A FET preamp with balanced output. Yes, balanced output. So it's got an XLR output. So that makes more sense to me with a Mix Pre. Um, the Rode NT USB Mini is a good sounding microphone for what it is. It's, you know, $99 USB microphone. Um, but yeah, if I'm going to work with the Mix Pre, I'd go with the MXL 990. That way you get the benefit of the analog limiters in the Mix Pre. Plus, if you wanted to use a Mix Assist, if you were going to add that, that would be really helpful. So that's the direction I'd probably go. All right, cold light of day. I've learned a lot about gear and techniques over the last few years, but I have neglecting the best practices for metadata. Any tips? Um, I do. I will say this, when I'm working on a set... Um, as far as if I, if I'm working in my case, I'm working with a, usually a sound device is 888. I will go in and spend the time when I'm getting prepped to actually identify, put names on each of the channels. And that way, when it comes into post, nobody has any questions about what those channels are. And, um, it makes it a lot easier for the post engineer, whoever that is, uh, whether it's yourself or somebody else. So that's the main thing that I would say as far as metadata is concerned. Um, if you're if you're a solo mixer and a production set, you don't have a boom op, you don't have um, anyone else. It's a little bit tricky to do a sound report. However, the newest mixers have the ability to um, generate sound reports. And so, for example, if I were working with a mix pre, they have the little star button on the mix pre six, or they have the two star rocker switch on the mix pre ten. And what I would do is I'd probably set one of those up so that they could, if I don't know, I can't remember if it's possible or not. The Mix Pre 3 doesn't have the star key. Um, but if I think you can set it up to make it to circle a take. In other words, to say, if, a, if the director says after a take, that was the one, you nailed it, then you can circle that take and that'll come out on the sound report. So that'd be helpful for the post team as well. That, that way they can identify pretty quickly which take to line up with video and save them that time. So those are the main things that I do as far as metadata is concerned. Um, yeah. All right. Eric, I am looking to get into, to get some used electrosonics. What are some things I should be aware of when shopping? I would be careful of eBay. <laughs> Nothing against eBay, but um, I do have a friend, Scott Vanderbilt. Um, we went to NAB. He met me out there one year. I think it was in 2016. And he showed up with his used electrosonics receiver and transmitter and he had I think he had bought them on eBay or somewhere like that and he had tested it before he came out and it was fine and then he got there and we were getting set up and he couldn't get it to work so we walked over to the electro booth and they said well we can't really you know every you're doing everything right so there's something wrong you probably have to send it in for service so he sent it in for service they opened it up and it was entirely and completely corroded on the inside so it looked like they had, whoever owned it previously had probably dropped it in salt water and quickly dried the outside and then sold it. <laughs> so I guess that's one thing I would be careful of, or if, if there's any way to get any sort of guarantee or, you know, return policy 
anything like that, um, that's what I would look for. So those are the kind of things you just can't tell from the outside of the unit necessarily. Um, and unfortunately, I think most people that are selling used are probably selling you a good unit, but they're going to be the bad players every once in a while too. So that was just one unfortunate story. I think there are a lot of other people that are using used electro gear or other gear and just perfectly happy with it too. Like I hope some of you will be when we, when we give away and sell some of this gear that we're going to do here in a few minutes. In fact, we probably should get to that. No? There's we have important questions. Oh, there's more important questions. We better get those first. Okay. Droid, um, anyone know, is the line in setting for the mic line in on the ATEM a true line or a padded mic in? I don't know the answer to that. Um, a lot of times on cheaper gear, it's just a padded line in, as you well know, or padded mic in, excuse me. They just put a, it's still getting amplified by the amplification circuit, but they're just reducing it after that. So I don't know the answer to that on the A10 Mini. Not sure. Teacher of teachers. <clears throat> it's time for a drink of water. Sorry. Believe us when we say Utah is dry. Yeah, believe us when we say Utah is dry and we don't have issues with humidity here. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have to add a graphic for several seconds to an otherwise talking head vid, but there's no talking under it. Should I add room tone under there to prevent dead silence, Dave? Yes, I definitely would add room tone. Um, it's a really weird experience. Um, at the very least, add a fade out and a fade back in. But usually it's a weird experience, especially for people that are wearing headphones. They'll especially be able to hear it. But yeah, I would add room tone if you can. So definitely make a, a smoother process, a smoother listening and, and viewing experience for your audience. Graham, are you planning to do any run-throughs on the Atom X Sync for the Ninja 5? I know you have a Ninja... I now have a Ninja 5 for my B-Cam and I'm planning to get an Ultra Sync 1. Um, I don't... I don't have a Ninja 5, and I don't have the Atom X Sync box. I do have a UltraSync 1, um, so I don't have any plans right now for that. And honestly, I don't really have the appetite to buy one, a buy, to buy a Ninja 5 <laughs> at the moment. If I could borrow one, I'd be happy to do something like that, but no, no immediate plans for that. Sorry, Graham. Are all the outputs on the Mix Pre series line level? I have been trying to find info on them, but only reaching dead ends. Well, Yang, they are, um, yes, at 0 dB, I think, at 0 dB, they, yes, they're line level. In short, the short answer is yes, they're line level, but you can also attenuate them to go into a mic level input if you need to. So that's the short answer. And we cover how to do that in our Mix Pre course, if you're interested. Jason. Any thoughts or comparisons for the Bear Dynamic DT240 Pros for location and studio monitoring? I've heard a lot of great reviews. I haven't, um, uh, I've been following your, your and Caleb's recommendation for the MDR7506 as a standard, but wondering if you had experience with these. I can use these wirelessly without having to mod the 3.5 millimeter jack. Um, are, are those wireless headphones? I don't know. I, I'd be careful with wireless headphones for production monitoring and the, the, it's not so much for the reason most people would assume it's not audio quality so much uh, that can be a factor but um bear dynamic it has more to do with latency is the bigger issue in my experience but let's take a look at those headphones oh boy there's so many headphones from them how do i find them uh, there's no easy search. DT240s is what I'm looking for. So let's just do 240. Here we go. So this is basically a DT240 plus a microphone. What is, uh, not really clear on that. So no, the short answer is I have not used them. Um, let's go here. They're showing a DSLR shooter with them right here. Powerful transducers, true professional sound, tuning for pure and precise reproduction. Uh, 
Yeah, they, those should probably be fine. Um, they look like they're... They call them circumoral, which means they go around your ears. Um, yeah, they... I mean, I've been happy with my bear dynamics. <laughs> I use them in the studio all the time, the 770s, but... Um, I would not hesitate to give them a try, is all I can say, I guess. Uh, what is your worst film audio gear investment ever made? Probably an ATEM 2ME switcher, although Emma disagrees with me. She prefers to operate that one <laughs> than the ATEM minis. Um, no, I guess you're, you're asking... Let me talk about audio gear. What did I not need that I bought? Hmm. I'm having a hard time with that one. I guess really what it comes down to, I don't I haven't bought any gear that I was like, ooh, quality wise, this is horrible. More more likely what is more likely to happen, I think, is that you buy something that you really don't need. I guess I, I know what it... Well, no, I wouldn't say that, but I'm not sure I would have bought Comtex. If I were buying today, I bought actual Comtech brand Comtech, Comtex for um, providing wireless audio to producers and directors and script supervisors. And if I were going to buy again today, I'd probably buy Electro or something else. I wouldn't buy the Comtex. They sound awful. They're pretty pretty horrible. Um, so I, that's probably my worst purchase. And they're expensive for what you get, too. Um, I think they actually started in the... Um, the kind of the main market they serve is for hearing impaired, so for people or people that need translation services. So they put those on the head, you know, they wear those, and then someone's on the other end translating for them. So um, anyway, and they can also be used for hearing impaired situations. So not the greatest sounding, but they do the job. So probably not, probably, I don't know if it was a, my, a horrible investment. It, they work, but they're not my favorite. I would have spent my money other ways today. All right. Uh, time code question via tentacle sync. Since the F8 can generate its own time code, so does that mean I only need tentacle boxes for my cams? Do I get one for my F8 N2? No, you don't need one for the mixer since it already has one built in. Just need them for the cameras. Good way to save some money. <laughs> Not have to buy an extra um, tentacle sync. Hi, Curtis. I'm using Zoom F8 on F8N on set. One thing I'm curious is, can I get the file names with the scene numbers on every single file? I get files tangled up in Pro Tools every time. Um, I have to refresh my memory on how that works exactly, but my recollection is that, yeah, you name the scenes and then you have a take number. Mm, so you have that flexibility, but I'm not sure if you're trying to, like, you can individually, you can go back and rename files, I believe. Um, so I guess I need more details on what you're looking for. If you want to email me at curtis at learnlightandsound.com and give me an example, love to kind of chat through that with you in more detail. So, okay. Last one. Last this one. Good. This is a good one. How did you get into the industry? Um... Ooh, that is a good one. When you bought the drum set. It started when I bought the drum set? Yeah. That's where you're gonna set the flag of start? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to be a drummer. That's how I got into the industry. Um no joke. Well, I was already a photographer, so that was part of it. So let me just clarify here what I am and or kind of how I identify. So I would probably call myself more than anything, I am a for my day job. I'm a part-time product manager and I'm a part-time corporate videographer. So that's what I am there. Um, then I then I would consider myself an educator in the off hours, <laughs> like what we're doing here today, creating the online courses and things of that nature, mostly focused on sound, also a little bit on lighting, um, a little bit on live streaming as well. So those are kind of, and, that, and that's kind of a meandering path that changes all the time. But I think the... In terms of recording audio, where I learned a lot of that was initially from my brother, who was a musician, and um, he was a touring musician 
And then he would go to studios, like more traditional studios back in the 90s to record his albums. And then, you know, right in the late 90s, the gear necessary to make a pretty good recording, a studio quality recording, became a lot more accessible. And so he bought his own DigiDesign's 003 interface, audio interface, um, which I think back in the day was a Firewire audio interface. He bought a universal audio preamp and compressor unit. He bought a Neumann TLM-103 large condenser, large diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, and then he he actually brought that over. He went and picked it up at the Guitar Center in Salt Lake and brought it here to our house. And we had to play with it. And so over the next few years, he learned kind of how to how to do that and taught me most of what I knew from that perspective. And then I recorded an uh, actually an audio book um, at one point using a USB microphone, believe it or not. <laughs> and then once the DSLR videos got video as well, that's when I think it really kind of took off for me as far as sound for video. And um, that's when I started doing videos for my at my work and things of that nature. And so just learned a lot of lessons, made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of lessons that way. Did a lot of experimenting on my own and posting to my own YouTube channel as I kind of started to figure things out. Um, and the, really kind of the approach to my original YouTube channel, my YouTube channel when I first started it was not so much I'm an expert and I don't I still am not comfortable with saying I'm an expert at this I'm not um, but what I do try to do is when I posted those early videos and in, in particular was when I figured out a problem that was plaguing me then I created a video about it so here are the things that I learned when I was trying to deal with clothing rustle for example with lavalier microphones or you know what works better outdoors or, you know does it make more sense to use a boom microphone or a lavalier microphone and kind of the answer is it depends um <clears throat> so i guess that's that's kind of a shortened version of how i got into the industry i i don't do a whole ton of um like i'm not working on big budget productions to be honest like i'll do i'll do small budget commercial productions and by small budget i'm talking probably the biggest one i worked on was a budget of about thirty thousand dollars um, for the entire thing um, so those are the kind of things that I hire out for every once in a while, but, um, and then the rest is corporate video and when, what I do for YouTube and live streaming. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's useful in some fashion, Danny. So thanks for the question. Okay. We got some things we got to do here. Um, Emma is going to make me drink some more water in just a second here. And, uh, we have some gear. So let me just run through what we have here and let me give you some background. So I want to say something very important first. Uh, I am trying to declutter my life a little bit because all of the stuff around me is preventing me from being more creative and more productive. What? Why are you laughing? <laughs> Emma's laughing at me over in the corner here. <laughs> so here's, the, I, I've actually read some minimalist books and I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not going to become one of these people that, and I have nothing against the people that do it. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm probably not in the game to be the type of minimalist that has a hundred total items that I own in my life, period. And it's just not going to happen um, for the work that we do. But um, what I am finding is there's a lot of gear sitting around here that's not getting used. And um, it's just very weird what that psychologically does to you. So um, we're going to go ahead and I want to give some of this away. One of the things I actually bought previously and I'm going to we're going to sell that one um, but let's run through it what, what I'm all, all this to say be careful don't don't bid on these things just because they're free don't ever take anything just because it's free take you know if you're gonna if you're gonna bid on it do it because it would actually be useful to you that's my only advice um, the first one is going to be the Centrance mic port pro 2 this is a very cool little single um, single XLR USB audio interface. It's a very simple but super rugged design. It's made out of all metal. Well, the knobs are, are rubber. What? Why are you laughing? <laughs> Keep the blue starfish. Okay. We'll get to that later. Okay, we'll get to that later. That... <laughs> we are going to keep... It's actually a crab. His, that's actually our mascot. His name is Pincer. Um, we'll come back to that later. You can see he's wearing a beret. Um, Emma put that there for us. Anyway... Back to the MicPort Pro 2. Um, this is actually, I, I think, what they this company, Centrance, did is they made a very straightforward device. It's all analog controls. There's no screen, no menus. It's all dials and recessed switches and things like that. It has an inbuilt battery. 
which they actually, I, I believe they said they will replace if you need it replaced. So it's not just e-junk. Um, but it, the, the very cool feature is, number one, the preamps sound great on it. And number two, it has an analog limiter in it. So if you do voiceovers or mobile streaming where you just need to run something into your laptop, this is a fantastic device. And it comes in a little sleeve here. I think it, I think these are, they run about $279 US. So in fact, a lot of people that buy Zoom, like H4Ns, I think would probably be better off with one of these than those personally. Okay, so that'll be the first one. That's a giveaway item. Next item is also a giveaway item. It is the PodTrack P4 from Zoom. Um, this is a podcast recorder for XLR inputs, 70 dB of gain, so it can drive your gain-hungry microphones like the Shure SM7B. Um, that one runs about $200 US. That's a giveaway item. Next up is the Asden SGM 3500L. It is a, they're calling it a long shotgun microphone. Technically, it's actually closer in length to the, you know, kind of a typical, what I would now call medium shotgun mic, like the MKH 416 or DADS Mic 2 or Rode NTG3. Um, this is a great sounding microphone. Why am I giving it away? Because Asden gave it to me. I did a review a couple of years ago and, um, I have so many great shotgun microphones, this one just never gets used. But it does sound good. It's much better than our first generation shotgun microphones. And that's also a giveaway item. That was given to me, so I give it to you. Um, this one is actually for sale. This one I bought with my own money. It's a Zoom F4 field recorder. Um, this one we're going to sell for $100. So the way this is going to work is we're going to choose the random numbers and... Um, do that. So this is a great recorder. The only downside to this is that it has been discontinued. Zoom no longer makes these. However, it is a fantastic four input recorder. In some ways, I actually like this. There's some things about this I like better than the F8N. <laughs> I like the full-size XLR outputs on this. Um, anyway, this is a great recorder. So we're hoping to give someone a nice start on uh, their field recording experience. So let's run through these. The, ways this, the way this works is that if you guess a number and don't guess any numbers until Emma's going to Emma's going to have something to say in just a minute here. So we're going to give her the microphone in just a moment. Um, but let me just say a couple things. I'm going to choose a random number. If you are interested in that particular piece of gear, then you should guess a random number after Emma puts in the chat that we're starting. And then you have to put your number in before it ends. We actually made a mistake in the last giveaway. We apologize. Um, we chose the wrong... Um, person as the winner we got it sorted out afterwards so everyone is okay everything everybody's still happy and alive um but uh that's how it's going to work so let me have emma tell you more okay uh, i was actually stopping you because we have a clarification need uh chris asked 3.5 millimeter out question mark on the sentence let me check Um, no, the R4R, which is a bigger version of this, does have a 3.5 out. This one does not. It only has a headphone out. So it is really made as a USB interface. It does have two USB ports, one for power, one for data. Um, but no, it does not have a 3.5 millimeter out. Good question. Yes, we do ship international. However, you are responsible for covering the cost. Yeah. Yeah, we ship everything U.S. Postal Service, and it's just, it's cheap, but it's slow. And so, yeah, that's another thing. If you are in a hurry, this is probably, we just have to ask for your patience because we, we're not fast at shipping here. Emma does the shipping and she's in school, she's in university right now. And so she's got some midterms coming up. It may be a little while before we ship it to you. We promise we will ship it to you and we won't charge you for the shipping until we are ready to ship, so. Generally, we say one to two business days for handling. Are you really ready to commit to that? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's do the giveaway. Are we ready? Yes. Okay, I am going to... Do you have... Do you need your mic still? Uh, I need to type, so no. Okay. Are we going to mute you? We can We can always uh, bring it back. I want to talk more, but, like, I got to type. I know. You type, and then <laughs> when you're ready to talk, let me know. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have generated the random number. This is for the Centrance MicPort Pro 2. Um, does have this... Uh, like, cheat sheet that comes with it, little laminated cheat sheet. It comes with the little kind of velvet case and the record, or sorry, the interface itself. It is not a recorder. It is a USB interface. Okay. 
So when Emma says go, then you can go ahead and start. Okay. Are We're going. Ready? We're going. All right. Yeah. Numbers Excellent. are 1 through 50. Yeah, between 1 and 50. And Camille, um, you cannot put equations. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, you may not put 666. Yeah, or you'll get banished if you do that. You get booted <laughs> if you do, Kevin. There's actually some stuff that was in the chat that we didn't get to uh, that I think we should talk about. One was the question of why we use metric when we're in, based in the U.S. Because um, I, I would like to be on par with the rest of the world. A lot of, well, here's one thing. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel and you look at the analytics, the majority of the audience is actually outside of the United States. And it's basically the rest of the world uses metric except for the United States. I feel like if I had been taught metric in school, I wouldn't have had trouble in chemistry. That would help there too, yeah. For whatever reason, in, in 1980, the U.S. was supposed to switch over to metric. Um, I don't know what happened exactly, but I think Ronald Reagan came into the White House at that point and had other priorities. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was the... It was probably actually Congress that made the change. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know the history on that. We're just trying to be good world citizens. That's the short version. Yeah. Antonio asks if you have any plans for a shotgun mic battle in terms of Zoom and like video calling. I assume that's like a rap battle. I don't know. I didn't have any plans. <laughs> Do you mean a comparison of a whole bunch of shotgun microphones? We did that. Is that is that what you're reading? Yeah. Okay. We did that with the, with the Rode NTG5 in, uh, review. We actually brought several in there. Um, we also, so I basically try to do it whenever I review a new microphone. I do have once a year or so every 18 months, maybe I go back and do kind of a meta review of boom microphones. And so I'll have a shotgun category. Last time I got some grief over the video because it, there were so many. Okay. So we'll come back to that timeout. Uh, the number was 24. So Emma is scouring through the, we got a lot of numbers. We got a lot of numbers. Oh boy. Okay. Well, while Emma is looking through that, um, let's go ahead and switch me back to here. I'm going to switch to the, okay. So um, back to the shotgun mic. So I did a meta review of boom microphones and there were so many, I only had so much time to get the video out. And so I didn't actually, what I did is I linked to all the reviews of these different microphones that I'd done over the years, but I didn't actually have samples from all of them in the same video, in that one meta review video. And so people gave me some grief about that. So next time, maybe I just need to plan two weeks or, you know, however much time we need to do something like that. But yeah, we'll definitely do something like that again. Um, and maybe we need to do something fun. I don't know how we're going to make it fun, but we'll find a way to make it a little bit more fun than it has been. Okay, Emma. We have three 22s and a 26. Hmm. Well, I'd say the 26 is a little closer, wouldn't you? To 24? Mm-hmm. Oh, to 24. I Sorry, I was thinking 25. Ooh. Um, Might have to have those three people do another guess. Are you still scouring? Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, I guess short version. Yeah, we're going to do a microphone shootout at some point. The trick is, is that I don't have, I'm not going to have all of them on hand anymore again, because I'm trying to minimize things. So I won't have, for example, this SGM 3500L on hand. Um, but I, I do, I'm keeping, you know, Sennheiser MKH 416 I bought, not because I needed it, but because it needs, it's kind of a standard reference microphone. Uh, are, are you ready to talk? We've got four people. If you had a 22 or a 26, I will put your names tagged in the chat and then we will have a rebid. Okay. And so you'll tell them when to start rebidding. Yes, I will tell you when to start. Okay. So while she's doing that, I'm going to, um, I, I was talking about shotgun microphones. So anyway, it'll be a little tricky to, um, cause I'm, you know, I, I'm giving away some of the, those that I don't use, but I do have to keep the MKH 416 because it's a reference. The DPA 4017B is my go-to for most production jobs. Um, I actually keep the uh, Rode NTG3 as well as kind of a reference. That one's super popular, ubiquitous, and a lot of people use it. So that one, I do like the NTG5 quite a bit. 
I haven't, I don't have, I haven't found it in my, in my heart that wants to be a minimalist to give that one away yet. <laughs> Maybe we will someday. Okay, here we go. Wait, I, sorry, I had muted you. Oh, here are the names. Okay, we're doing a rebid here, peeps. The reason I laughed when you were giving your little minimalism lecture at the beginning of announcing what we were giving away, I wasn't expecting a minimalist guru moment. <laughs> well, There's nothing wrong with that. I no, just wasn't expecting it. I'm not a, not a guru by any means. Just uh, Just trying to be a better person and make the world a little better. That's very good. That's admirable, actually. And somebody said, mom needs to change the lock on your wallet so you don't end up with all that clutter. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, is a, not all of it is uh, stuff that comes from my wallet, though. A lot like the, I will say, actually, I bought the pod track P4. That was with our money. Uh, Did you but, regenerate the number, by the way? Oh, no. Generate the number. Boom. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, yeah, some of these things I bought just because there's demand. Okay. So the number was 46 this time. Excellent. Is this our winner? That's him. Richard Bully Photography. So Richard, go ahead and email us at curtis at learnlightandsound.com. We'll make arrangements to sh uh, for the shipping for you for on the Centrance MicPort Pro 2. And um, we'll send you, you know, what the shipping cost is and we'll get that on its way. If you could include your address, please. Yes, go ahead and cl include your shipping address when you send that email as well. That's Thank you for that, Emma. Okay. Cool. Let's move on to the next item then, shall we? Can I mix the audio? Like, can we figure out a way for me to do that? Because typing and microphoning at the same time is... Ooh. It's bad. It's difficult. It's difficult, yeah. Yeah, when... Uh, I promise you that when we start doing our live streams, when it warms up from out there, you will have the mixer at your knee. I like that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so next up we have the PodTrack P4. For those that are podcasters, a couple of things about this. I did a review of this earlier in 2020. Um, it does have some limitations. Its max sample rate is 44.1 kilohertz, so I need you to know that going in. It's So if you're going to be on broadcast television, you do not want this. <laughs> um, but otherwise, if you're just doing audio podcasts, it's probably fine. Um, it does have some pads so you can play back pre-recorded sounds, whether those would be like intros, outros, commercials, stingers, whatever. Um, it does not have, it has headphone outputs, but it does not have a 3.5 millimeter line out. So it's not really for sending audio to camera. So don't expect to do that with this. It's really an audio podcast um, type of device. It is also a USB interface, um, but I think just stereo, if I remember correctly, I don't think it sends ISOs to the computer. So cool little device. Um, the preamps are pretty surprisingly decent for, um, for its price. So let's go ahead and start the bidding on that. Emma's gonna go ahead and put that in the chat for you. All right. Um, I was surprised that this could work really pretty well with a Shure SM7B, which is one of the most gain hungry dynamic microphones available out there. Um, and we did not need a cloud lifter or a FET head or anything like that. So it did pretty well. Emma is going to generate a new number, which I failed to do. <laughs> Please remember. <laughs> um, okay. So the screen is not amazing, but again, it's a for a two hundred dollar recorder. It's pretty impressive, and I would love for it to go to a home where it gets loving use on a regular basis, instead of sitting in a drawer in my cabinet over here. And because I need more room for other microphone. Wait a minute, that's not minimalist. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are the guesses coming in? They are. They are, okay. Is everyone being well-behaved in the chat? They are, thank you. Thanks for being well-behaved in the chat. You know what I just realized? On the uh, ATEM Mini Extreme, I left the... Um, bit rate set for hyperdex and so we're streaming at 24 megabits today so the picture had better be pretty darn good um i forgot to switch it back to streaming high but I, as far as i'm aware youtube hasn't been complaining maybe it has let's see uh they are saying it's higher than the recommended bit rate oh well they can live with it <laughs> tough luck youtube <laughs> I mean, thank you, YouTube. We love you. Thank you so much for, you know, hosting our 
this fine show. Apologies, that was out, that was out of hand. Okay, so this number was the random number was thirteen. So Emma's going to take a look through the chat here and see if she can find a thirteen. There's a fourteen. Oh, there's a fourteen. Pretty close. The tension. I'm feeling the tension. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, there's a 13, though. Just one 13 or two? I don't know yet. Oh, okay. Yes, there's just one 13. One 13. Congratulations, sir. Okay. Jean-Francois Champagne. I don't know if this... I didn't. probably didn't say that right. That was close to correct. Um, but you are the winner of the Zoom PodTrack P4, so if you would please email me, curtis at learnlightandsound.com. Please send us your address, and we will arrange the shipping for you. So thanks for that. Okay. Let's show you the next thing up. Emma's going to do some typing here. Do you need me to mute your channel or are you good? We're good. Okay. Um, it does actually, one of the things that you'll see pr typically on um, pro level shotgun microphones is they will pr provide you with a frequency response for the individual microphone. And they actually did that on the Asden here. So they were trying to move up market and I think they did a good job. Just for you as that want to see what it looks like. So it does come with the mic clip, the foam cover, and the microphone itself. Looks like that. So let's get this one all queued up. This is for the Asden SGM 3500L. It has very good isolating properties. It's a pretty tight pickup pattern. So in those situations where you really want to kind of isolate the sound and get just what you want and reject what you don't want, this is a pretty good mic for that. Just like other microphones that tend to have the really tight polar patterns, it does have, you know, off-axis the sound changes a bit. So anything that's off-axis will sound a little bit otherworldly, but that's that's uh, part of the game when you're going for the tight polar pattern. Do I need to generate a new number? You do. Okay, we have that generated. All right, and we're bidding? We are. I'm oh, not bidding, guessing. Yes. Guessing, okay. Podcast is here. Hey. Andrew, it's good to have you here, pal. Okay, lots of people want this one. Really? Uh-oh. <laughs> this one looks like a popular one. Um, okay. Yeah, well, it's a useful piece of gear. Ooh. I don't know. Bandrew, have you ever reviewed this? He'd have to throw the sleeve, not the box. Yeah, I would recommend if you ever do, just, just throw the sleeve, not the actual hard case. Um, I don't know. You don't do a lot of shotgun microphones, though. He's he's the guy that does a lot of large diaphragm condenser microphones, ribbon microphones, uh, dynamic microphones, anything you would typically use in podcasting. And it's a lot of fun to watch him play 90s pop punk. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to take me forever to look through, so maybe you should tell the origin story. Origin story? Oh, of Pinsir, the crab? Sure. All right, so... I'm going to mute you here for now so you can do your looking. Um, so here's here's the story. So this is our new mask. This is not actually a new mascot. This is an old mascot. This is Pincer the Crab. Uh, he's wearing a beret. Uh, one of the very first videos we put on my channel, which is no longer there because it didn't fit and people were just kind of hating on it. Uh, Emma and I made a video with uh, it was me interviewing Pincer the Crab, who is a filmmaking crab. It and was very cringy. It was cringy. Um, but it taught us a lot and we actually had to rotoscope. So I wore a black glove and animated pincer as he talked. Um, and then I had to rotoscope that out and it actually came out. It was okay. It was, that part was okay, but that was in the time when we were making silly films. Yeah. Goofy stuff. Just trying to learn. That's yeah. what we're, that's, that's the way you learn is you make stuff, you do stuff. So the number for this one was number nine. Ooh, there's a nine. There's a nine. Emma's looking through the list. Well, there's two nines. Two nines. We're going to have to have a, a guess off. Three nines. Three nines. Oh, my. Okay. Anyway, so that's that's Pincer is our mascot. Um, he is basically the microphone police. If I say anything wrong, he is supposed to gesture and say, you know, behind me so that I can't see, but you can, that what I just said is something you shouldn't believe. And you should. Um, anyway, that's Pincer the Crab. 
All right, so Emma's going to go ahead and get the numbers. That, uh, there are three people that chose nine. I will and... tag you, and you will have another one. Okay. So we're going to have a, a guess off. So for those of you that are tagged in the chat when she puts that up, um, you will guess a new number. We'll generate a new number, and we'll take it from there. So I'm going to switch back to me, and I'm going to generate the new number. And wait for please wait for the item from Curtis Judd Audio in the chat. There it is. There it is. Okay, so go ahead and for those of you that all tied on 9, go ahead and put in another number between 1 and 50. And we have generated the new number here. And Brian's giving uh, you Fs in the chat. Who is? Brian. Brian. Barass. Brian, why are you giving us Fs in the chat? Oh, I hope everything's okay also, for you. Also, Brian, my nails are not painted. They are fake. You are not on a mic. I know. I'm just spewing into the abyss. Don't spew into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. What is coming up? You know, I have... Did you regenerate the number? I regenerated the number. I'm still muted. This is why I need to mix. Okay, you're <laughs> unmuted now. Thank you. Um, so the new number was 12. Excellent. And so let's see. Emma's. Oh, it looks like Lee is the one that wins. And I believe you are in the Philippines. So we're going to have to work on shipping there. <laughs> We've never shipped to the Philippines, so I don't know what that's going to look like, but we will price it out and get in touch. So if you would please contact me, curtis at learnlightandsound.com. Please send us your mailing or your shipping address, and we will figure out the pricing on that and uh, work that out. Okay. Ready for the next one? We are. Okay. This is the Zoom F4. This so, is for sale, not for giveaway. Yeah, so this one's for sale. So you, in this one, the difference is that you, if you do choose the right number um, and you are interested, and you should only put a number if you are interested in this, um, this will be $100 plus shipping. So um, we have to offset some of our costs a little bit. This one's been gently used. It has never been, gosh, it's never been through an actual proper uh, out on out on a proper set. It's been used a little bit for corporate video. I think we used it two or three times to record something pretty simple, but this one's just not getting a lot of use with all of the other recorders I have around here. Um, so with that, I will generate a number and Emma will put a little thing in the chat when you're ready, when you should start to um, guess numbers here. And then we'll go ahead with that. You can probably hear her typing madly over there. <laughs> this costs money. Yeah. Disclaimer. Yeah, so this one's $100 plus shipping, just so you're aware. Um, all right. Andrew um, asks if, quote, spewing into the abyss is the Judd's new hardcore punk band. Uh, well, we're thinking about it. We, um, I think Emma would be the lead on that band. I don't do punk. <laughs> I'm lost in the hip hop sauce. I'm sorry. She's it lost. could be a line in a rap. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so probably not hardcore punk. Um, it's also what I do on Twitter. Are you inviting people to follow you on Twitter? Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want a bunch of people like her dad following her on Twitter. You can follow me on my music Twitter when I make my music Twitter. Okay. It doesn't exist yet. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So we have generated the new number, and it looks like the guesses are coming in. I could put 18 trillion. <laughs> Ike. Fair enough. Ike, you are disqualified, my friend. <laughs> Nicely done. We're a little over time, people. Sorry about that. It's because there were important questions. There were important questions that we really needed to address. And we had, it'd been a couple of weeks since we had a, just a regular old question and answer session. So by the way, we are looking to potentially bring, for those that saw last week's with Brendan, where he talked about his Zaxcom recorder, we're actually looking at bringing him back to talk about his Atmos mixing room, which I'm pretty excited about. Dolby Atmos, for those that are not familiar, is kind of the next generation surround format. Um, it's not tied so much to the number of speakers, but how they're oriented and what you can do with them. So you can place mu or sounds basically in 3D space a little bit easier than you could with like a 5.1, 7.1, 13.2 or whatever. So 
Did you regenerate? I did regenerate the number. Excellent. The random number was 39 for the Zoom F4. So Emma's going to take a look through the list. Ooh, there's a 39. There is at least one 39. There's two 39s. Two 39s, okay. The tension, oh my. This is a happy day. I'm so happy to have somebody have the Zoom F4 that will be able to use it more than I do. The poor thing sits there all the time. It's pretty cool. It has two SD card slots. Uh, you can power it via the... In, there's a tray for eight AA batteries, or you can... There's a Hiroshi input, so you can use like a cinema battery or any sort of smart batteries. Um, so you got a, a number of ways you can power it, which is good. I actually like the knobs on it. It's, they're bigger than the F8, so it's a little easier to operate. The screen's not as good, though. Um, but... Um, my friend David in the in New Zealand used this actually for professional work for a while until he earned enough to buy a sound devices. Uh, 633, I think is what he moved up to. Okay, running the rebid. We are doing the rebid. So if you were one of the people that chose 39, you are now rebidding. And I'm going to go ahead and generate a new random number, which I have just done. And if you people would go ahead and do your rebid, then we will see who gets closest. Yeah. Might have to get your calculator out to see who's closest. I really hope that I don't have to do that. Please don't. <laughs> okay. Here they are. Here they are. Okay. You can stop the bidding. The magic number was 21. I will need a calculator. You will need a calculator. Okay. I haven't done maths in more than a year i'm sorry a calculator on the live stream okay what, what do you need to calculate we need the difference between 29 and 21 which is eight okay and 21 and 13 which i believe is also eight minus 13 is also eight Ooh. Do we have a bit off again we gotta do it again okay. two more numbers y'all two more numbers so let's go ahead and take random org off the screen and i'll choose another random number okay i think you two people know who you are right they should. Okay, well, make it clear, just so there's no question. <laughs> so I'm going to type that in. I'll go ahead and choose a new random number here. Wow, this one's uh, exciting, like the, the tension. It's a doozy. <laughs> it's rock, paper, scissors. Uh, yeah, rock, paper, scissors, kind of. Um, I hope the question about the MKH-50 and the Sheps, I hope that wasn't a cop-out, but, you know, it's, it's so hard. It would be impossible to choose, I think, to choose between those two. Okay. Do we yeah. have a new random one? We do you have a new random number? Okay. The new random number is 35. Woo! There we, we have go. a winner. Nocturon, you are the winner. You chose 31, which is the closest to 35. So if you would contact me, Curtis at learnlightandsound.com, go ahead and include your mailing address and we will make arrangements to get that shipped out to you. All right. Are we good? We are. We're good. Okay. Everybody, thanks so much for coming to our live sound for video session. Uh, congrats to those who have the new gear. I hope that it, it gets lots of use at your home uh, instead of just sitting around collecting dust here at my home. And we will talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.